excellent, excellent Muqaddimah introduction to this noble topic and this noble book as well. So we don't have to go into detail in that regard. Inshallah ta'ala we will continue in our reading. And we will begin from the chapter Zaman Faridat al Siyam. The time frame or in the obligation to fast was established. Okay, when was the obligation of Suyam fast fasting established? وَقَالَ مُؤَلَّفَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَكَانَ فَرُدَهُ فِي السِّنَةِ الثَّانِي مِنَ مِنَ الْهِجْرَةِ وَتَوَفِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَقَدْ صَامَ تِسْعَ رَمَضَانَاتٍ وَفُرِدَ أَوَّلًا عَلَى وَجْهِ التَّخْيِيرِ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَنْ يُطْعِمَ عَنْ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينًا ثُمَّ نُقِلَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ التَّخْيِيرِ إلَى تَحْتُمْ الصَّامِ وَجُعِلَ الْإِطْعَامُ لِلشَّيْخِ الْكَبِيرِ لِلشَّيْخِ الْكَبِيرِ وَالْمَرَأَةِ إِذَا لَمْ يُطِيقَ لَمْ يُطِيقَ الصيام. The Shaykh Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he continues with the chapter, when was the obligation to fast established? And he mentioned in the meaning, the obligation to fast was established in the second year after the hijrah. The second year after the migration of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to al Medina. And let me ask you brothers, how long was, how long were the companions in Mecca? Okay, meaning after the Prophet Sallallahu received revelation, how long was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions that followed him in Islam in Mecca? Does anyone know the answer? Yes. 13 years. 13 years. Very good. So the companions were in Mecca. Okay, after the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu they were in Mecca for 13 years and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was not commanded to inform the nation and the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to perform a siyam Okay? So 13 years, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala did not make it obligatory upon them to perform a siyam to perform the fast. But rather, He made it obligatory upon them the second year after they migrated to al Medina. Okay? Meaning, after the completion of the first year, as they entered into the second year, after the migration, it became upon them to fast. And as he mentioned, that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ performed nine Ramadans. Okay? He fasted nine years, you can say. Or, he witnessed nine Ramadans. Okay? And the manner in which it was revealed, or the manner in which it was established, it was established... In a way that it was optional, okay, or you can say partially obligatory, or you had you had to choose one or the other. Either you could fast, and but if you chose not to fast, then what? You could feed someone that was poor, okay. Meaning an individual had an option in that. However, one of them was obligatory upon him, okay. And I'm going to touch on some of these points, inshallah ta'ala, as we go along, because clearly this shows us the Ikhwan, as I mentioned. 13 years in Mecca, okay? And two years of being in Medina, the obligation of Siyam came and was revealed to the Muslims. So what does this show us? What does this show us? This shows us that as it relates to the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took the Muslim in stages, okay? He did not make it obligatory upon them uh, instantly. Meaning when they were in Mecca, when they were small in number, when many of them were new to the faith of Al-Islam. No, but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them by stage, took them by stage, and then He finally, after some time, after uh, deciding to make it obligatory upon them, He made it obligatory upon them. After nurturing their hearts first. So, He mentioned that if an individual chose not to fast, then He would, give it, he would be given the option to feed some a poor person, for each day that he chose not to fast, he would feed a poor person. And then it became, and it went from becoming optional, okay, to obligatory. And then the individual had the option to feed a poor person for each day that he chose not to fast, for the sheikh or the sheikha. The individual that's old in age. 
means and they're not physically able to perform a siyam. And what this shows us, Shaykh Ikhwan, and yani, we're going to skip some points as we want to focus on other points that are more important. And yani, as we mentioned, this shows us a tadarwaj. Okay? A tadarwaj fit tashri'ah. This shows us how the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was taken in stage. The Muslims, as I mentioned, were in Mecca for 13 years. And they were not obligated to perform a siyam, to fast. They were not obligated to perform hajj. Huh? As some ulama mentioned, hajj was established. Does anyone know when the obligation to perform pilgrimage was established? Does any know, anyone know what year the obligation to perform hajj was established? And it's from the pillars of Al-Islam. Does anyone know? Huh? Very good. Or actually the, any the, exactly, the ninth year, it became obligatory. Okay? Very good. The ninth year after the Muslims have migrated to al Medina. The, obligato- the, the obligation to perform the Hajj was established. Okay? So we'll take that into mind. As we mentioned, the fast became obligatory in the second year after migration. What about Az Zakah? Ibn Hajjal al Asqalani mentioned that it was made obligatory, and Az Zakah is the charity. It was made obligatory in what year? The fourth year after the Hijrah. Okay? What about Salah? Does anyone know what year? And it should be easy, inshallah ta'ala. Huh? Does anyone know what year the prayer was established? Huh? What year did it become obligatory upon the Muslims to pray? Does anyone know? Yes. Huh? Very good. Okay, the night of ascension of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, which was in the what? Twelfth year in Mecca. Okay? I mean, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, was a prophet for 12 years, and then it became obligatory upon him. Yani the last year, while they were in Mecca. Okay? So let me ask you this question, Ya Akhwan wa Akhawat. What was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching them meanwhile? And what was the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, teaching them during this time frame? Okay? Meaning, they didn't have to pray. They didn't have to fast. They didn't, didn't have to perform pilgrimage. They didn't have to, to give the charity, the zakah. What were they being nurtured with? What were they being taught? Does anyone know? Men huh? Men rabbuka, who's your Lord? Okay? They were being taught the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? My point in mentioning this, Shaykh Ikhwan, is to show us how things are to be taken step for step. Shayin for shayin. Okay? As we see clearly illustrated how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose not to reveal upon the Muslims, maybe because of their weakness at that time. Okay? Maybe because they were small in number, maybe because you know their iman was not yet strong enough to perform certain actions and deeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them by stage, took them by stage, and revealed upon them what? How to worship Allah, how to worship your Lord. This is what I'm trying to illustrate. This is the point that I'm trying to make here, ya ikhwan, wa akhawat. That is important, ya ikhwan, that as it relates to us, that we are to take things in stages, shayin for shayin. As we actually emphasized this some time back, a few weeks ago outside, with Allah alhamd. Likewise, for those that are non-Muslim, for example, okay, an individual should not yani, burden himself, or he should not feel as if because he has certain sins, he has certain ma'asi, certain things that he's struggling with, that he cannot become Muslim. Because things happen in stage. Some people will lie, even just, for example, just about an hour ago, I met an individual. He said, and I invited him into the masjid. He said, no, I won't come into the masjid because I have some sin with me. I said, well, Allah, don't let that be a deterrent for you. Okay? Because things happen in stage. You come... You start, you, have, you start from somewhere. This is my point. You start from somewhere and then you work upon that. You build upon that. Shayin for shayin. And this is actually a qaida in al-Islam. That al-aham fal muhim. The most important affairs are to be given preference over that which comes after it. Because we clearly have the hadith illustrating this. Of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. لما بعث معاذ ابن جبل رحمه الله رضي الله تعالى عنه إلى يمن فقال 
يا معاذ إنك تأتي قوما أهل الكتاب فأول ما تدعوهم إليه الشهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in a narration that was narrated by Ibn Abbas. May Allah be pleased with them both. Mu'adh, in, in relation to the time when he actually sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, he said, O Mu'adh, surely you're going to the people from the people of the book. So let the very first thing that you call them to be, that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. And then he stopped. فَإِنْهُمْ عَتِيُعُوكَ لِذَلِكَ And if they obey you in that, meaning if they establish the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, they establish how to worship Allah, and they remove the deities that they're worshiping, the idols, okay? And they, or they stop worshiping those idols, and they stop calling upon man in their prayers, and the likes of this, and they follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if they obey you in that and then take them to the next level. For in whom ذَلِكَ And if they obey you in that, فَعَلَمْهُمْ Then inform them. أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَدَ عَلَيْهِمْ الصَّلَوَاتُ الْخَمْسِ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمَ وَالْلَيْلَ And if they establish that, then inform them that the prayer has become obligatory upon them. Okay? And, and each day and night. Meaning taking, taking the Muslims in stage. Meaning he's commanding Mu'ad to go and teach them to Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Teach them how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And then when they establish that, then teach them that which comes after it. Okay? And then that which comes after it. You go on into the Az-Zakah. And so on and so on. Okay? So this clearly shows us how things are to be taken in stage. And as he mentioned... Ibn Qayyim, and continuing from this chapter, in regards to the time when the obligation of fast was established. He mentioned that if an individual feared for himself, such as the older individuals, and they, feel, they, they, they feared harm for themselves, or they were sick and they were unable to fast, then they would have to feed for each day. Each day that they weren't able to fast, an individual that was miskeen, a poor individual. وكان للصوم رتب ثلاث إحداها يجابه بوصف التخيير. Okay, now he's going into detail as regards to in the manner in which the the fasting was established. He said that first it was established in a manner which it was optional, obligatory slash optional, meaning that you had to choose one. It was upon you to choose one. Okay, but you had an option in that. Okay, and then he mentioned that the next stage, uh, the next manner in which yeah, it, the Muslims were taken, okay, it came in a manner where, and this is the second type, and it's the second step where the Muslims were taken as it relates to the fasting. That they were given the ability to only fast from Maghrib, or I'm sorry, to fast. And only break their fast from Maghrib until Isha. Okay? Meaning they had to fast during the day all the way up until Maghrib and they were able to break their fast, similar to us today. However, they only had this time frame in between Maghrib and Isha. In between Maghrib and Isha to break their fast. Do we understand this concept? Meaning they had a short period of time, possibly an hour and a half, okay, similar to our time now, to break their fast. And if Isha came in, they were not able to fast, okay? Meaning, they had, uh, I'm sorry, they had to continue their fast. They had to continue their fast. So once again, from Fajr, as we know, in the morning time, we have to begin our fast. And then we fast all the way up into Maghrib, and then we break our fast, we eat, okay? The Muslims during that time only had the chance to break that fast in between Maghrib and Isha, okay? And if an individual slept before that, then he, wasn't, he wouldn't be able to, 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 to break his fast. Even if he woke up in between Maghrib and Isha, then he still wasn't given the option to, to break his fast because he actually slept upon that. Okay? 
My point in mentioning this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the Muslims in stage. Okay, and sometimes he actually makes things easier for them. Okay? And then the next the last type that the last step, the third step that was mentioned, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually made it easy for us in the manner in which we have our fasting now. From we're able to break our fast in the end, end of Maghrib, and during Maghrib, all the way until the morning time. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Muslims in stage. And we'll go, inshallah ta'ala, to the next chapter. First one, Iqbal al ibadat fi Ramadan. This chapter is entitled Performance, the performance of actions of worship, and the, the plentiful actions of worship in the month of Ramadan. Okay? First one. وكان من من هديه صلى الله عليه وسلم في شهر رمضان الإكثار من أنواع العبادات فكان جبريل عليه الصلاة والسلام يدارسه القرآن في رمضان وكان إذا إذا لقيه جبريل أجود بالريح من ريح المرسلة وكان أجود الناس أجود ما يكون في رمضان. so the sheikh he mentioned in this next chapter that is entitled that an individual, and it's entitled, the performance of the actions of worship in abundance. It mentions that it is from the guidance of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, our noble Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that during this month of Ramadan, he would increase in his actions of ibadat, of worship. So that Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, would teach him the Quran during this month of Ramadan. Okay? And if, and likewise, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be, he would hasten towards giving the charity. So much so, it's been mentioned that he was, he was so quick to give uh, charity during this month of Ramadan that it was similar to the, the wind, okay, the quick wind that blows. Ajwadu bil khayri min al al mursala. What kind of edge within nas? And he was also the most noble of individuals as it relates to this month of Ramadan, meaning in his actions of ibadat and worship. And he would busy himself with plentiful actions of sadaqah, and he would give much charity, and he would perform many actions of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, he would read the Qur'an in abundance, and he would constantly be in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also performing the itikaf. Meaning, he would, he would stay and he make himself, and he would stay in the masjid for an extended amount of time in order to read the Qur'an, and to perform actions of ibadat. So inshallah ta'ala we will emphasize some of these points ya ikhwan wa akhawat as we are in the month of Ramadan and we are actually in the last 10 nights of Ramadan okay and it has been mentioned that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam during this time would be the most diligent in regards to his actions of worship especially in the last 10 nights of Ramadan we have the statement of Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha قالت كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يجتهد في العشر في عشر الأواخر ما يجتهد في غيره. We have the hadith of Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها that mentions that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would be more diligent in the last ten nights and he would be more diligent in these last ten nights compared to any other nights in the month of Ramadan. Okay, as the month is possibly twenty nine or thirty. Nights, 30 days. But he would be especially diligent in his ibadat, in his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last 10 nights, especially. Likewise, we have another statement of Aisha anha, that mentioned that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to mix his nights with salah and, and rest, and resting. Okay? During these first 20 nights. Okay, during the first 20 nights, the Prophet Muhammad would mix those two actions 
Okay, he would rest sometimes and he would pray. Rest sometimes and he would pray. Okay? But as it mentions, however, during the last ten nights, he would, you can say, for either Akan al Ashra, Shammara, or Shadd al Mi'za. And he would, as it mentions, and he would tighten his belt, okay, or tighten his Izar, that which would hold his garment up. Okay, it means he would actually perform more actions of worship in these last ten nights of Ramadan. And of course, this emphasizes the, the, the great importance of the last ten nights. So I have a question for the brothers. What's so important about the last ten nights? There's something specific that we're seeking. There's something, huh? Later to Qadr. The nights of decree. Sense. This is what the Muslims were seeking for. We're seeking <coughs> this night of Laylatul Qadr, which is the night of decree. It means this is the night wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes the, the decree for that which will come uh, next year. Okay, It's the yearly decree as it's been defined. As there are different types of decrees. Okay, As we know, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was what? The qalam. And he told it to write. He, he created the pen. And he said, write. And then the qalam asked him, what do you want me to write? Oh Lord, my Rabbi. Okay, oh Rabbi, ya Rabbi. He said, write everything that will occur all the way up until Yom Qiyamah. Okay? So everything is written, that which will occur. Okay? And nothing will change from this. This is the Loh al Mahfud, the preserved tablets. Every single action that you perform is already written. Does this mean that you can't perform actions? No, it doesn't mean that. But what, rather what this means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything you're going to do before you do it. Okay? He knew that we were going to have this conference today. He knew this. Okay? He knew that the brothers were going to be sitting here. He knew everything that was going to happen. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written all of these deeds. Huh? And there are other type of writings. Okay? Such as the, as we mentioned, the yearly writing, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he doing later to the the night of decree, that he writes that which will occur from year to yearly. Okay? Everything is known in the Lahul Mahfuz, okay, the preserved tablets. What's going to happen? Absolutely. Nothing will change in this. However, the yearly decree, as we mentioned, things may change, possibly, okay? And the angels may write, may take some things away, okay, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with this being mentioned, we would encourage the brothers to be mujtahidun in the last ten nights especially. And wallahi ya akhwan wa akhawat, many of us, oh brothers and sisters, many of us are immersed in sin. Many of us are surrounded by sinful individuals and, and we're constantly immersed in sinful actions. Disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah musta'an. And this time we have a fursa, we have a chance to perform those actions of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherein if we perform them properly seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah may forgive us for all of those sins Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive us for those sins and this is a great chance for us to benefit from as we know the noble hadith that mentions man sama ramadan imanan man sama ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dhanbi Allah, you have the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu where he mentioned whoever establishes Ramadan, whoever fasts during the month of Ramadan with true faith, with iman, and seeking the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, meaning he has ikhlas in his actions, sincerity. Allah will forgive him of that which proceeded of his sins. So, what does this show us, Ya Ikhwan wa Akhwat? This clearly shows us. That if we establish this month of Ramadan in a manner that is proper, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive us for all of those sins that proceeded. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive us for those sins. And this is a noble chance, wallahi, because we don't know when our time is going to come. None of us know. 
Okay? An individual may leave out here today, Allah, and he may not return tomorrow. His soul may not return to him when he wakes up this and he may not wake up this morning. Okay? So this shows that you Ikhwan that we should be diligent during this time. And there's something I want to speak about, inshallah ta'ala, and it's kind of outside of I mean, the topic. Or I mean, not in the correct order. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that there are two blessings that mankind is severely negligent in regards to. Does anyone know those two things? Ni'matani maghbunun fiha kathirun min al nas. That's one. He said time. Huh? Very good. Asiha wal farag. Good health and free time. Again, there are two blessings that mankind is extremely negligent in regards to. Good health and free time. Think of this hadith, ya ikhwan, wa akhawat. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from his jawami al kalam. This is from the mu'jizat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is from the miracles of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was able to say very short phrases, very short statements. However, those very short statements were comprised of many benefits. Okay? He was able to say one, sometimes one statement. Okay? One statement. And in that one kalima, that one word, or that one sentence, it, it was comprised of many benefits. Benefits that you can't possibly enumerate. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he mentioned firstly as-sihha, good health. Okay? Meaning that mankind is constantly negligent in this regard. Okay? What does this mean? Magboon. It means that an individual has good health. He has the ability to fast. He has the ability to perform the actions of obedience. He has the ability to pray at night. He has the ability to stand. He has the ability to perform asiyam. Okay? And not just during the, not just during the, the month of Ramadan, but outside as well. He has the ability to perform hajj, pilgrimage. He has the ability to perform all of these actions of obedience, but he simply chooses not to. This is the individual that is negligent. Okay? And think of this. How many individuals that we see, okay, that are not able to actually fast? Huh? Look at our elders. Some of individuals are not physically able to fast. Huh? But many of us, young brothers, mashallah, uh, myself as well, we have the ability to fast. alhamd. We should take advantage of this. It's a na'mah that we should take advantage of, a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, you have and free time. And this is specific to us during these last 10 nights of Ramadan. Possibly 8 nights remaining. Possibly. Okay? That we only have a little bit of time. And clearly the Messenger of Allah mentioned that it's something that mankind is constantly negligent in regards to. Constantly negligent in regards to. Why? Because he's constantly wasting time. Constantly wasting time. And many of us, we know ourselves. We can look at ourselves and say, you know, we know what we do. We know what we don't do. Many of us, we have that time to read. Do we read? No, some of us don't. Okay? We have time to benefit ourselves with that which is beneficial to us. Do we take advantage of that time and benefit ourselves? No, some of us. We know, our, everyone knows themselves. And all of us, we have time. Even if it's a little bit of time. Some are busier than others, but we have a little bit of time. Or we have some time, even if it be a little bit. So this hadith clearly shows that we should be diligent in regards to our free time, especially during these last 10 nights. Huh? And us Muslims, we know the importance of al-waqt, al-faraw, free time. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually sworn by asr, he's sworn by time, as he mentions, wal-asr, by time, meaning I swear by time, I make an oath by time. Mankind is in loss. This is the foundation of mankind. In loss. Except for those who believe. And perform righteous actions. And those that prescribe one another with the truth. And prescribe one another with patience. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my point of emphasis is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually made an oath by time, showing us the great importance of it. 
And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an oath by something, it's in order to raise that thing itself. Okay? He makes an oath by that thing. Okay? Which shows us the great magnitude of time. That we should take and that we should take advantage of our time. And wallahi, none of us know who will be able to make the next Ramadan. None of you can say, well, next Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, I'll complete the Quran. Next Ramadan, I'll do this. Next year, I'll do that. Tomorrow, I'll do this. And so on and so on. Huh? None of us can any guarantee this. Do any of you have a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will make it out of this door? None of us have this guarantee. Subhanallah. So we should be diligent in regards to our time, as time is very little. Okay? As some of the Salaf would say that any time is like a knife. Okay? If you don't use it properly, it will cut you. You see? If you don't use time properly, this knife, then it will cut you. It will harm you. So it can be for you or against you. And there are three things that will travel and in, that will travel with an individual in his grave. Does anyone know those three things? Three things will follow the dead person to his grave. Three things. Uh, huh? His actions. What else? Huh? Okay, that's another hadith. But there's a hadith specific to this. Huh? Huh? His family and his wealth. Huh? Two will return and one will remain with him. Huh? What two will remain with him? I mean, what will return? What two will return back? What will not be? Huh? His wealth and his family will return. Okay? His wealth cannot enter into the grave with him. Or even if it does, it's not going to benefit him anything in this grave. But rather his family is going to inherit that wealth. Okay? Well, Ahlu, his family is going to return likewise. They're not going to stay there at the grave. They're not going to enter into the grave with him. Even if they do, it's not going to benefit them. But his, what's going to remain with him is what? Well, And that which will remain with him is his actions, his deeds. That which he did in this life. Okay? Which shows us what? Yeah, Juan, That we should take advantage of this great month of Ramadan. And especially these last ten nights. And we should do away with the excuses. Huh? As you have the statements of Abu Huraira, as he mentions, من قام ليلة القدر إيمان واحتساب غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. Abu Huraira, narrated the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever establishes, or whoever, any, any, you can say fasts, or actually stands during the night of Laylatul Qadr with Iman وَحْتِسَابٍ and seeking the hope, seeking the, 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 the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will forgive him of his sins and from that which proceeded. And of course this relates to the, the sins, the minor sins. <coughs> okay? As we have minor and we have major sins. As it relates to those major sins, we are... Oh, and it's upon us to perform a tawbah from those major sins. However, from the minor sins that an individual may fall into, those sins will be forgiven. First one. <clears throat> inshallah ta'ala, we will end shortly, inshallah ta'ala, briefly. But we will focus on some of the points that we mentioned earlier. That is from the Messenger of Allah's guidance that he would fast during the month of Ramadan. He would increase in his actions of ibadat, of worship. And Jibreel والسلام, will read the Quran to him in every Ramadan. Do we know during the last year before the Prophet وسلم, died, Jibreel read the Quran to him twice? Okay? During this, you know, during Ramadan, he read the Quran to him twice. Showing us the importance of reading the Quran in Ramadan, especially. And outside of Ramadan, of course, it doesn't stop in Ramadan solely. And likewise, he would be diligent. He would hasten to give the sadaqah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, anfiqu min ma razaqanakum min qabli an yatiya yawm. 
من قبل أن يأتي يوم لا بيع فيه ولا خلة ولا شفاعة والكافرون هم الظالمون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions يا أيها الذين آمنوا أو you who believe أنفقوا مما رزقناكم spin give charity from the wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you with before there comes a time من قبل أن يأتي أهدكم الموت أو من قبل أن يأتي يوم before there comes a day where there is no بيعون there is no and you can't bargain in this in this day ولا خلة and there is no يعني no companionship no intercession during this time you can you cannot ask your friend to intercede on your behalf and there is no companionship and no شفاعه no one that will intercede on your behalf والكافرون هم الظالمون and the disbelievers are the oppressors so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions he's calling your ikhwan wa akhawat to give sadaqah to give charity before there comes a time when you cannot bargain you cannot you know you cannot pay for good deeds it's impossible so you have to be diligent in giving sadaqah as the Prophet sallallahu would be more diligent in giving sadaqah especially during Ramadan quicker than the any the rih. Think of the rih, the wind, ya ikhwan, wa akhawat. Huh? The wind. Huh? It benefits all individuals. Okay? For example, when, you know, in, in the summertime, for example, we, we love the wind, and it, it benefits us, especially when we're in shade. Okay? Think of this, ya. Yani, the Prophet would be, would, be, would hasten to give charity, especially during this time, ya, and it's similar to the wind, and the wind benefits everyone, meaning he would hasted to give sadaqah to anyone, huh? the Muslims, the non-Muslims, and the likes of that. And he hasted, okay? And, it, as in, and it, given the comparison to the wind, as has been mentioned in the hadith. Likewise, he would be diligent in reading the Qur'an. And he would likewise be diligent in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and al-i'tikaf, as our brother inshallah ta'ala will cover the ahkam of i'tikaf, of staying in the masjid. Doing these Nights, inshallah ta'ala. And continuing, it says, وَكَانَ يَخُصُّ رَمَضَانَ مِنَ الْعِبَادَاتِ بِمَا لَا يَخُصُّ غَيْرَهُ بِهِ مِنَ الشُّهُورِ حَتَّى إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِيَوَاصِلْ فِيهِ أَحْيَانًا لِيَوَفِّرَ سَاعَاتِ لَيْلَتِهِ وَنَهَارِهِ عَلَى الْعِبَادَاتِ It says, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would specify the month of Ramadan for his actions in his actions of worship, not similar to other months. I mean, he would focus specifically upon upon this month of Ramadan to perform those actions of worship, and not similar to how you would perform it during the other months outside of Ramadan. I mean, he would be more diligent during the month of Ramadan, hatta so much so that he would actually perform. Al-Wisal, which is he would continuously fast without breaking his fast. Yeah, right? Similar to during Maghrib, we break our fast. The Prophet ﷺ would actually be diligent in, yeah, in staying in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that he wouldn't break his fast at times. So much so that the companions asked him about this. They said that we want to fast like this. We want to perform Al-Wisal, which is a continuous type of fast without breaking, yeah, right? without having in iftar, without breaking your fast. Huh? Ramadan, mashallah, yani Maghrib, we're waiting to break the fast. We hasten to break in our fast, which is from the sunnah, with the alhamd. But the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during this time, he would perform al wisal He would be diligent in his actions of worship, reading the Quran, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much in abundance that he wouldn't break his fast for an extended amount of time. So much so the companions asked them, O oh, Messenger of Allah, huh? we want to perform this similar type of fast. We want to be, yani, we want to have a continuous fast similar to yours. Huh? He actually prohibited them from doing that. And he said, Lestu kahi'atikum, inni abitu, wa fi riwayatin, inni adhallu, inda rabbi yut'imuni wa yasqini. He said, I am not similar to you, okay? But rather, my Lord, he feeds me. And he provides drink for me. Okay? And some individuals from the scholars have actually had difference of opinions in regards to this statement. What is this, what is this sharab 
And what is this ta'a? What is this food and this drink? And to make it ikhtisar, and to make it abridged, some of them say that it's actually a, yani a type of ta'amun hissi. It's actual, it's an actual type of ta'am. Actual food and drink. Okay? And then the others, they say, no, it's a type of yani ma'anawi, or type of, um, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nurtures his heart with food and drink. Not actual physical food and drink. So there's a, there are those two statements from the ulama. Okay? And as we know, this book covers a lot of masail, a lot of issues dealing with fiqh. Okay? It covers a lot of the issues dealing with the rulings of fasting, breaking the fast. Okay? But we will skip a lot of those. And we will suffice with one statement by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he mentions. وقالت عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها أنها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن الوصار رحمة لهم عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها mentioned that the Prophet was telling them prohibited the Muslims from from performing a continuous type of fast out of mercy for them out of رحمة for them okay and then you have these statements of the Messenger of Allah صلى which also indicates clearly that we should hasten to break our fast, and there's actually a virtue in breaking our fast. As I ready, <coughs> as Abu Huraira, ready Allah Taala and who mentions, لا يزال الدين ظاهرا ما أجل الناس الفطر إن اليهود والنصارى يؤخرون. Abu Huraira, ready Allah Taala and who mentions that this religion will remain. Upon the truth, as long as they hasten to break it and to break their fast, for surely the Jews and the Christians they prolong the breaking of the fast. Meaning, it's from the ways of the Muslims to hasten to break their fast. And then you have the next chapter that talks about the establishment of the month of Ramadan. And with Allah alhamd, we're already in the month of Ramadan. And we will suffice with one statement, inshallah ta'ala, as a, uh, and to abridge this issue. As there, and it has arisen some difference of opinion amongst the people in regards to the sighting of the new moon. How do you establish that the month of Ramadan has been established? And actually there's valid and a difference of opinions at times, as long as an individual is not depending solely upon the calendar. And this ummah does not depend upon calendars, but rather it depends upon what? The ru'ya. Seeing and witnessing the hilal, the new moon. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرِ فَلِيَسُمْ Whoever witnesses it from you, meaning the new, the entrance of the new month, the month of Ramadan, then let him fast. Okay? This clearly illustrates to us what? That when we witness the new moon, it's upon us to fast. Okay? And we should leave off these calendars. Okay? This is not the ummah that does these type of things, but rather we depend upon the sighting of the moon. And this is the prescribed sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are two other chapters that we wanted to cover. However, we will suffice with that, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, for five minutes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> lastly, inshallah ta'ala. And, it, and abridged of what we mentioned, and, and, and abridging that which we mentioned. We would like to encourage the brothers and the sisters to perform as much effort as you possibly can during these last months, these last nights of Ramadan. As we mentioned, our days are short. Life is short in general. We all know this. Huh? Some of you may look at your gray hairs today. SubhanAllah. And, you know, you may reflect upon when you had no gray hairs. Okay? Or when you were young in age. Okay? So life is very short and we should put forth effort and be diligent in regards to our time. Al-waqt kasayf. Uh, the time is like a sword or a knife. If you, don't le- if you don't use it properly, it may cut you. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore, has actually made an oath by it. Wala asr. By time. I swear by time. Meaning this is a noble and important thing for the Muslims. Yani al-waqt, time. Shalla ta'ala will suffice with that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslim kabira. If we made any mistakes, then it was from myself.
for myself only and my notes. I'll moderate the I don't know where he's at. Okay. I don't know where our moderator is. <laughs> Bismillah wa salam wa salam wa sallam wa Alhamdulillah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward our brother Abdul Rafi Hafibullah As well as all of our brothers who have come here and travel These brothers have traveled You know, to come here And to benefit the people today And I'm not going to prolong this But we definitely should thank them And we should appreciate it And we should travel ourselves You know, they deserve that we travel To them in other places that we may hear that they are, you know, benefiting the people. So, we want to introduce our next speaker, our next teacher, and our brother, Abu Rehana Akio Ingram, who is not a stranger to many of you, who is not a stranger to many of us. And as we know, our brother, he has been teaching, he has been a student of knowledge, he has been teaching, he's been, you know, leading the people as an imam, in several different states in the United States, you know, giving da'wah, giving da'wah you know, nationally, as well as traveling, you know, to benefit and seek beneficial knowledge and to bring it back and to teach us beneficial knowledge, and very active in calling to Allah Ta'ala and the Sunnah of His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we hope that we will begin to see these brothers more often in Baltimore. Why is that? Because Baltimore is in need. We're not just singling out Baltimore, but we're speaking about our present situation. Baltimore is in need of a revival, of a revival of Islam. And this is not I, or exiting people out of Islam, but it is need of a revival of Islamic teachings, of Islamic knowledge, of Islamic activities, of the brotherhood. As we see today, brothers from Masjid al-Haq, brothers from Masjid al-Hisan, Brothers may be possibly from Masjid Mu'mineen and Masjid Salam and, these, and some of the Masajid may be Masjid Umar. We see, that we see us gathered here today. It is possible. It was some time now, for some time, my, my existence in Baltimore, you know, you find that you go to one Masjid and you only see the people from that Masjid. You know, you don't see the people gathering, uniting, joining with one another for a benefit, you know, cooperating upon birr and taqwa, but this is something that we encourage. That this is not just something that is, you know, during the month of Ramadan, but outside of the ra- month of Ramadan, that we begin to unify and upon that which is correct and utilize our resources for one another in order to strengthen the call to Allah. It's about the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a call to a place, not a call to an individual, it's not a call to anything, any group, or any clique. This is the call to Allah. And the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a call that does not, yani, it is not something that, yani, how do we say this, it's not something that, that uh, discriminates. It's not something that discriminates. Everybody has the right to be called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody has the right to be called to Islam. And this is what the Muslim wants. He wants all of the creation to the best of his ability to be guided. And we know that Allah ta'ala, what he has said about that, but we try our best. Now, so we want to introduce our brother, Abu Rehana Akio Ingram to benefit you all <clears throat> in the short time that we have to do this before uh, time to break the fast. Five minutes? Okay. He said we give it five minutes, inshallah. Akhir kitab. Akhir kitab. Akhir kitab. Akhir kitab. Akhir kitab. Akhir kitab. 